Board Committee, Lynn Spiegel, couldn't be here to present, so it's my deep honor to do so. Our award winner is Jane Gaines. <laughs> For her remarkable lifelong contributions through research, teaching, and service, Jane Gaines is the recipient of the 20, this says 17, that's false, 2018 SCMS Distinguished Career Achievement Award. Professor of Film at Columbia University, Jane Gaines is widely recognized as a pathbreaking scholar in film studies in general and feminist film history in particular. Through her unique mix of empirical research and philosophical inquiry, Professor Gaines has produced stunning new insights into film history while also provoking important theoretical questions about history itself as a field of knowledge and cultural power. Her groundbreaking book, Contested Culture, The Image, The Voice, and The Law from 1991, was one of the first to approach film history through the lens of critical legal studies, revealing how the law imprints itself on cultural productions through such practices as copyright and trademark. Following this, her innovative book, Fire and Desire, Mixed Race Movies in the Silent Era from 2001, you can applaud it. <laughs> Considered the complex history of race movies focusing on the early black independent film movement and filmmakers such as Oscar Michaud. This book and her previous groundbreaking essays on this topic were among the first to explore the dynamic relationship between whiteness and blackness in the silent era. Demonstrating among other things the racialized nature of desire and the gaze and questioning the category race movies itself. Both of her books received the Katherine Singer Kovacs Prize, both from the Society for Cinema and Media Studies. Fittingly then, the Distinguished Career Achievement Award makes Jane Gaines a three-time winner and true SCMS royalty. In addition to her award-winning books, as if that's not enough, Jane Gaines has co-edited four anthologies, is the author of influential chapters and articles on such topics as fashion and film, feminist and critical race theory, early cinema, intellectual property and piracy, and documentary. For her more recent research on women film pioneers, Professor Gaines received the highly coveted Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences Scholarly Award, as well as a fellowship from the Radcliffe Institute. Based on this research, her new book, Pink Slipped, What Happened to Women in the Silent Film Industry, has already been called a groundbreaking and brilliant history of women film pioneers, that not only recounts women's labor and achievements, but also provides a way to theorize historical time and to think about why these women's stories were forgotten for so many years. Professor Gaines' influence goes way beyond her influential books and essays. She's one of the founding editors of the Women Film Pioneers Project, a digital archive and research tool published by Columbia University Libraries. She's also co-founder of two highly successful conferences Visible Evidence and Women in the Silent Screen. As a teacher, Professor Gaines created Duke University's Film Studies program, and she's now building Columbia University's graduate program in Film and Media Studies. And they're happy. Across her career, she has lectured internationally, has served as consultant and or curator for such venues as the Museum of Modern Art, the Film Society of Lincoln Center, the Museum of the Moving Image, and the Library of Congress. Jane Gaines' contribution to the public life of film studies and to feminist history would, for many people, be a life's work in itself. As one of her nominators put it, Jane herself is a woman film pioneer and continues to be so. On behalf of the awards committee, I offer Jane our deepest gratitude for her scholarship and our enthusiastic congratulations for this honor, and we invite her up to speak.
This is great. Uh, thanks to the elected officers of the organization and to all of the members who read manuscripts and write reports and review new works online. Thank you. That's working really well. And Android. Android. No, that's better, actually. That's way better. Yeah, there we go. Okay, and, and for posting incredibly irresistible links online, uh, sites, and uh, keeping us posted. That's for the memberships. Thank you, Canadians, for fostering such politeness at immigration. Politeness not encountered on the other side of the border. Those living outside the Northern Hemisphere may not know of the special historical generosity of Canadians toward Americans. After the election of George W. Bush, Canadians even offered to marry Americans. <laughs> but that offer seems to have been resented recently. <laughs> This also seems an appropriate time to thank colleagues who were and are passionate allies in the struggle to start programs in elite universities that did not ask to have them. But also to credit current and former students from whom we learned to be up to the technological minute. As you know, this was once called the Lifetime Achievement Award. And thanks to the wisdom of the STMS Executive Committee, it's now called Distinguished Career. My guess is that the recipients objected that the award seemed uh, to prematurely announce the end of careers, or that SCMS wanted to distinguish this award from that other one, the one given by the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, where you get to wear Harry Winston jewelry and Carolyn Ferrara gowns, and Michael is not the only photographer. It's <laughs> that one you get for really enormous fame and fortune. But wait, as we know, the Academy's Lifetime Achievement Award may be a consolation prize for not having received an Academy Award, and it usually goes to white men. Today, in the year of Me Too, we might want to speculate about one career or another that was thwarted. And we even might want to debate the price women have historically paid for visibility on the biggest screen. Too high, some will say. But what if she hadn't? Others will reply. Clearly, historical star studies will never be the same after Me Too. As for comparisons women are now making between ourselves and motion picture celebrities, we might even be tempted for a second to think of Me Too as an equalizer. Then we remember the highly paid public relations campaign that developed the Time's Up phenomenon to address the wage gap in women's work. Now for me, for someone who recalls the New York and the Chicago Women's Film Festivals in 1977 and 78, there is also that gap of 40 years of relatively little progress in the industry. So here's where you should be starting to see one aspect of the title I've given my talk, Once More, because we're trying once more and not giving up. But so much sociology and counting the numbers misses something that Me Too gets at, which even the most progressive of organizations, which is this one, need to acknowledge. That is what can happen when we no longer just seethe and grumble and whisper, but when we all speak out, all, yes, White men have historically been given a gift, a gift of enormous advantage tied up in a bow. How can we see that gift is the elephant in the conference room that has historically been in, and I'm actually borrowing that metaphor from Seth Meyers at the Golden Globe who called Harvey Weinstein the elephant not in the room. <laughs> now, who amongst us, who amongst us who hasn't been heard, who has wished to be listened to, not order, in order, not just to be better than, but to be just equal to, hasn't wanted to, to have a voice, to be the voice. In the academy, we're saying, that is, 
in universities, in curatorial positions, in the arts organizations we belong to. We're saying move over, make room, although in a kind of underground and unofficial way. And we're hoping that catches on. Now let me step back and also say that that moment, this Me Too moment, has actually not discouraged us, any of us, from still comparing ourselves with motion picture idols. On the contrary, within cinema studies, we know the importance of having a fantasy of something. What drew us to Joan Crawford and Betty Davis was the fantasy of being powerfully effective, a fantasy in which you transform things just by the way you spoke to others, others who reacted in your presence by melting or capitulating or screaming depending on whether you were playing the victim or, as we know, they often play these viperous tyrants. So I am channeling Jane Baldwin's, James Baldwin's attraction across race to Joan Crawford, who for the young Baldwin was black like women he knew, or like Davis, who was not white but green like a lizard, as you remember. And all of this makes the triumph of Get Out that much more delicious especially when we realize how the film reverses Baldwin's dilemma. We're asked to imagine white people who go to a lot of trouble, a lot of really terrible trouble. You've seen that film, horrible trouble, not just to be like, but to be black people. So my return to this fantasy of effectiveness, like millions of young girls who dreamed of a career as a star of stage and screen, is one where I remember that I did actually practice an Academy Awards acceptance speech in front of the mirror. You all did. But for me, the real difference between that speech I practiced and this one is that I imagined receiving that one and practiced it, but I didn't either imagine or practice this one. This one I never imagined receiving, not ever. This speech, the one I'm giving now, I never, never practiced for the audience of the mirror as I probably should have. Not growing up, not later, not once. I, I'm going somewhere with this, I promise. Now, what does my never in a thousand years reaction tell us about a generation of women who are never expected to have academic careers at all? For one, they might have had what the, I'm calling this fantasy of magical effect, and even they sometimes miss the mark by overshooting because what was out there that for Canadian women and American women, the Queen of England, okay. N not, you know, a possibility, but what you took what you could get. The other motivator in the absence of icons was actually something stronger for me. And I really think this is a great moment to confess that it was the aversion to women's traditional work. So what was it that women of our generation were expected to do? And the answer is make hors d'oeuvres. In anticipation of life's work of entertaining husbands, my sorority sisters exchanged recipes for canopies, but I never sent one in because I never learned to stuff peppers. I became an academic to get out of the kitchen. And it's a good reason. What I think is most important to say about the institution and the academy that helped us most, in some respects, is that it was university catering that saved our lives. <laughs> Many factors did also contribute to the increase in women in the US Academy, most importantly, equal opportunity legislation and the tenacity of the first tenured women who fought for others. Not to forget that before there were any senior women, there were a few men who noticed the talents of their female students. And one I'm going to mention who you might not have guessed was Jack Ellis, who was one of the four founders of the Society for Cinematography, or Cinematology. Uh, it sounds like cosmetology sometimes. And of course, the, fun, the forerunner of this organization. Not anyone you associate with feminist initiatives, but I got my start in his 1968 class on documentary. Now let's think further about that generation of women for whom no career was anticipated. This is also that generation who didn't see a woman wearing a serious suit until around 1970. Today, however, with the exception of commentary on Hillary Clinton's pantsuits 
and Melanie Trump's parody of the pantsuit, the discourse on women in suits, once so contentious, has trickled down to nothing. So here is my reference to the iconic suit as historical, yet as a marker here of the distance we've come in the field. When my graduate student best friend Rusty Herzog and I wrote an article on Hilde Johnson and her man-tailored suit, we violated a feminist film theory prohibition. To research and write about clothes was a rebellion against orthodoxy. Orthodoxy? Feminism? In 1978, there were only two articles by British feminists and we were in silent revolt against the prescriptive unpleasure paradigm they laid out. When during my PhD oral exam, I was asked if there was such a thing as feminist film theory, I said no. I was thinking of narrative pleasure and visual cinema, and I didn't think that that paradigm could actually expand to encompass all we needed to do. Today, we may wonder how feminist film theory could become an orthodoxy so soon on arrival. Isn't intellectual inquiry, by definition, we might have asked, an adventure in refusing received knowledge? So, to make things more complicated, not only were there three feminist, their feminist prohibitions within feminism, but feminism itself was prohibited at the time. In 1979, we worried that our feminist panel wouldn't be accepted at SCMS at San Francisco State. In that moment, pretty much every feminist article and book we read was about objectification and commodification, a position I still maintain is always in danger of lapsing into moralism. And then around 1984, a chapter that gets let out in many of the intellectual histories of our profession, the feminist pro-sex position emerged. It emerged in the Barnard College Conference called Sex and the Scholar. The pro-sex moment made us wonder how an anti-sex feminism could grow out of and even coexist with the sexual revolution. But now consider how the visual pleasure paradigm both jump-started and coexisted with the first feminist work on porn studies. Following the stunning analyses of gay male porn, Tom Waugh and Richard Dyer published in Jump Cut. The challenge to the maleness of gendered looking seemed a promising critical tactic, especially following 1979 when the first US critique of male gaze theory was performed by two lesbians. Some in this audience may remember that moment. Lucy Arbuthnot and Gail Seneca delivered a joint paper on the ritual viewing of gentlemen prefer blondes, which they called GPB. And they delivered this with arms around each other. I haven't seen this since. What has happened to that wonderful performativity of lesbian love on the podium? It was the Lolita Racklin Rogers Conference, and only later did it occur to me that this sharp lesbian critique was launched in Evanston, Illinois, the very suburb of Chicago where Laura Mulvey had written her seminal 1975 article on Grove Street where the building no longer exists but we will put up a plaque. <laughs> now, one th other theme of what I'm calling one more, one, once more with feeling is the particular difficulty of writing intellectual histories. One would think that the intellectual historian has it made because all he or she has to do is consult conference proceedings. But the shifting sands of consciousness and the vicissitudes of concept, concepts, not to mention ego investments, make intellectual history an exercise not unlike herding cats. And of course, there are the structural inconsistencies that we should expect. It was Chuck Kleinhans, the ever radical intellectual force who first alerted me to the contradictions within feminism when he pointed to Mulvey's visual pleasure article that was at odds with her analysis of Douglas Sirk on melodrama. 
43 years later, melodrama, now an overarching modality, is said to structure all of American popular genres and quite possibly Chinese, Indian, all manner of world melodrama across the globe. As for affect studies, sometimes and sometimes not part of feminist melodrama theory, issues of form and feeling have been reviewed before I recall Kathleen Woodard's conference at Milwaukee, where she took up emotion, and that was in the 1980s. Obviously, we weren't through with those concepts. Now, given the untamability and malleability of knowledge, we can argue either that melodrama and affect never went away, or that we have returned once more. Why return? For one thing, melodrama is where the most intractable of social problems can be seen to echo deep philosophical dilemmas. In melodrama, ideological positions are rehearsed as in the tra intransigent standoff between love and money, or as in the rift between paternity and biology and the mixed race person. We study melodrama as a political worldview, the legacy of social division grasped as forces at odds while we debate its origins in the French Revolution. Perhaps we return once more because melodrama theory has developed the infinitely productive paradigm of irreconcilability, taking up the toughest of social injustices and either resolving issues temporarily, abandoning them in the last ambiguous frame, or postponing outcomes week to week as in TV seriality, to which we've returned once more after the British initial work on TV in the 90s. Once more, further calls attention to quickly discarded legacies, the theatrical stage, radio, broadcasting, although it's great to see some of the uh, award-winning articles and books bringing back radio. In this category, and updating it, in this category of once discarded is also documentary. Written off in the 70s critique of realism, but brought back around 1993, and in the explosion of interest, we discovered Nanak of the North has been even recanonized at the same time Flaherty and Grierson have been excoriated. Then again, these particular returns are shored up by the degree to which they contend with the hardest philosophical issues of our time. Why popular journalism insists, what, what popular journalism insists is truth versus falsehood, and we don't leave it at that. But the documentary relation for us has to do really with something more. The more, the more baffling philosophical questions that plague us all, like, do we exist? What constitutes proof of existence? Or nearly as perplexing the non-existence of things either extinct or no longer necessarily uh, useful in the creation of in images. Now, I began by intimating that in 1978 there were field orthodoxies. But there is something to be said for orthodoxy, if not foundationalism. Well, one thing, actually, if we don't lay down foundations, the reasoning goes, graduate students would never confront positions to overturn, never become restless, never want to strike out on their own. So my comments about earlier orthodoxies are meant to alert us to the productivity of overturning, standing our ground against, that is, taking new positions and reformulating earlier ones. One generation's impasse is another generation's breakthrough. What then are the current field orthodoxies, if any? One which I both subscribe to and attack regularly is that beginning in 1917, the US exported to the world, to Japan, Australia, to Argentina and Brazil, narrative cinema. And if not orthodoxies, there are our critical sacred cows, among which is the auteur director, perennially reformulated, but never to be abandoned. Then there's our weakness, so close to our fandom, for archival prints of classic film titles, let's call this our necrophilic, cenophilic tendencies, <laughs> tied to traditional historiographic approaches, the older, the more alluring. 
Then there are uncontested intellectual habituations like the use of postmodernism as synonymous with post-structuralism. I, I get this is my one chance to sort of, how should we put it, um, pet peeves to put them out there and see if there's anyone who agrees with me or not. Um, another pet peeve is the use of modernity as singular when I really think that there were so many. Uh, would capitalism have gotten more virulent if our critique had not lapsed after the so-called fall of communism in 1989? Perhaps we tired of critiquing capitalism after so many years of nothing happening. But now how do we bring back Marxist theory once more, but with a difference? Now, while we might disagree on the reigning orthodoxies, I suspect that we can find agreement that today we're at a juncture are said to be in transition, which buys us some time. But then it could as easily be argued that we're no longer in transition. How then do we negotiate such a Teutonic field shift, the one for which the film and TV industry has been so ill prepared? Surely the industry noticed when Tower Records on Sunset Boulevard closed in 2006. They could have started then. But while we may take a cue from the media industries, our predicament as scholars is on a completely different order. We would theorize the shift, but how with such a paucity of terms? Out there, as my best example, is analog versus digital. I think we inherited those terms, and we have to push further. Other terms have been recruited, bodily, memory, storage, information, and of course, media. That too has been repurposed. 10 years ago, who would have predicted we would return to that Canadian, Marshall McLuhan? How then to explain our field other than as the discipline that keeps changing its name to fit the morphology of its object of study? Uh, wait, correction, morphologies of its objects, plural. But remember the year to uh, encourage and enthusiastically respond to the idea of bringing back the plenary section. Lev Manovich on that plenary panel after our 2002 name change suggested that we should be called the Society for Software Studies. It went nowhere. <laughs> now, why do I call this talk once more with feeling? No, it's not a reference to episode six of Buffy the Vampire, that musical one, you remember it. Neither does it reference the Stanley Donnan directed 1960 film starring Yul Brenner, you remember him. My title could be mistaken for the old guard's proverbial seen it all, here we go again complaint. Don't take it for that. Admittedly, the long field view, advantage afforded by decades of cinema studies conferences, produces every vanguardism as a deja vu moment. Intermedial kind of sounds like extra textual. Veterans of 40 conferences may be finding it eerie to contemplate media archaeology occupying the place that Lacanian psychoanalysis must held in the field. Yeah, maybe, maybe not. Media archaeology resonates, and perhaps it's the relation to Foucault for whom there never was an official moment, but who never really disappeared either. So, epistemological shifts. Thank you. We remain poised and ready, expectant of epistemological shifts to come. And here, when I refer to epistemological shift, I smile. Reminded that I once gave a paper on the mode and theory that I called wearing the epistemological shift. It referenced, actually, a gag gift I received as a graduate student from my department chair, Patty Wannell. The present was a burlap bag dress embroidered with the words epistemological shift, <laughs> which is clearly it was his way of poking fun at the seriousness of his female graduate students. Now, the epis that epistemological shift, the one you wore, gives me a chance to explain the other origin of my title. It's inspired by the name of a secondhand clothes shop in San Francisco called Once More with Feeling. But in New York, there's a runner-up, and it's called Second Time Around. 
So if love and clothes can be even better, what else could also be as we repurpose theory? Think back to the 1978 Brighton Conference on Early Cinema, now reverential point um, in the field of reference marking the shift to the historical turn. One can find in the same year a Foucaultian translation from the Edinburgh Film Festival Journal published in screen with a foreword by Jeffrey Noel Smith who identifies the high moment of anti-historicism the same year as the Brighton Conference. Hmm, the historical turn and anti-historicism the same year? Hmm. The very anti-historicism that was part of what was called the impasse of 1970s film theory? Now, what, while we might deny it, let's admit that it's possible to hold two opposing positions at once. And maybe this is where the empirical can intersect, or did intersect, with the theoretical. But if I were to nominate a more recent watershed moment, it would be the 2012 Histories of Asian Film Theories Conference at the University of Michigan, co-sponsored by Screen Cultures and the Permanent Seminar in Histories of Film Theories. Most striking for Euro-American attendees was the unfamiliarity of the thought of early theoretical workers, uh, the Japanese Goda and the Korean Imwa, surprises for us in those ideas newly translated from Korean and Japanese. Conference paper publications and translations from these language promise a future reversing the old west to east flow of ideas. Now last month also the Chinese government took over the colossal Anbang Holding Company, which among other businesses had in its portfolio New York Waldorf Astoria Hotel. And this was the moment that the New York Times announced a new Cold War. And this inspired for me what I call a new, one of two new birth narratives. Thank you. Birth narrative number one. To call this immediate moment the new Cold War encourages a birth narrative which posits the beginning of film studies in the long Cold War that separated Europe from the US uh, and, and uh, actually the rest of us from Russia, Eastern Europe, from China. This rewriting, the one I'm proposing, makes the 60s student protests against the Vietnam War a point of origins. Looking back, recall how in the US, the worry about how to legitimate ourselves in the academy was resolved by association with continental philosophy. But we might never have had post-structuralism at all if it hadn't been for an event that took place in New York City in preparation this month for a screening of the third world newsreel classic, Columbia Revolt, we returned to April 1968 in an attempt to verify the apocryphal story that the May 68 Paris riots would not have happened if Columbia University students had not first occupied the administration building on campus. Former students now confirmed that Paris telegrammed New York. We have taken the building, now what do we do next? Here is where cinema media studies figures in this story. In the French reform from the traditional disciplines, literature, history, philosophy, a ministry commission set up in France, the linguistics department at Vincennes, and new professorships went to Michel Foucault and Guy Deleuze. Graduate students were funded. Amazing. As important, the more militant faculty at Vincennes, the Communist League Trotskyites, decided to call themselves the Mausitang Cell. Now, aside from the point that the infusions of funds can go a long way toward reconfiguring the parameters of knowledge, one might be tempted to take from this birth narrative the utility for us of an intellectual history that begins with convulsive events. The 60s student riot, anti-war riots, and consequent revolt against the French Academy. But in the interest of thinking critically about birth narratives in the field, that a field that doesn't really believe in birth narratives, I, I want to propose a second because I don't want to say this is it. So here's a second birth narrative to make us think about how many more we can write. Thank you, second. Okay, this birth narrative begins in October of 1892. 
It was Antonia Dixon who as early as that year asked, what is the future of the kinetograph? And we all know where she wrote that. That same year, as Miss A. Dixon, she published 950 Miles by Telephone in Kessier's Magazine. She reviews the test of a new science at the New York headquarters of the Long Distance Division of AT&T, the voice transmission between New York and Chicago. The first word in her 1892 article, telephony. As she defines it, the propulsion of sound to a distance. Yes, Antonia Dixon was there at that transmission and afterward announced that telephony was the future. I'm raising this case, however, not as the old hidden from history complaint, and I never advocate that we rewrite to get it right. What I would say is that we use the authority of history as the venerable past to make a point in and for the historical present. In fact, we always do exactly what traditional historical methodology prohibits with their word presentism. If there is continuity with the past, it's the one that we have created as an exquisite illusion. Deference to the past as authority, as source of meaning of the present, however, may subscribe to an empiricist certainty that goes hand in hand with the dubious claim of historical studies to the status of science. As we know, the authority of history as historical phenomenon or event is only an authority on condition that we defer to it. And this is a secret that we as scholars keep together, so don't let it out. In the spirit of the late Hayden White, who died on March 10, let's remember that all stories are fictions. In his last book, he also advocated the practical past, not accounts written by professionals, but versions of events to which we decide to subscribe together, often at conferences and meetings such as this, which is why I am calling these two myth, origin myths, actually and encouraging us to write more. I've recruited Antonia Dixon's use of the word telephony, and in so doing, break another methodological rule. Implicit in historical research, albeit denied, is the attempt to predict the future. This can be done without necessarily saying that the present is the consequence of past events, or even that there's descent by virtue of that analogy with biology that we call genealogy. Most pressing for us is strategic field survival. If we recall how film studies was not accommodated by those two traditional disciplines of literary and art historical studies, we see how digital culture might as easily fall out of cinema and media studies. In my career, I've seen one dean approve a separate new media program and another confuse us with digital humanities. Years were dedicated to the problem of film grammar on the analogy with language, only to conclude that not only is cinema a mongrel medium, but that innumerable intellectual currents converge in our theoretical literature. What is it then that is most difficult for cinema and media to incorporate? Assessing our professional organization at this juncture, the hard question is one of where exactly we want to be in the academy now that the organizational members have their tenure tracks in a range of departments. Do we want to be somewhere separate or be everywhere? Everywhere in humanities departments, even in departments of engineering. Both separate and everywhere, right? If we don't continue to redefine cinema, however, we will be a field confined to only one century, which I have been calling the cinema century, but should revise to cinema centuries plural. Because the more we call attention to the death of cinema, the more precarious our position. We love the ambiguity of dead, not dead, but the dichotomy is also dangerous. On the one hand, our growth as emerging field may be endangered by association with a dead object. On the other, literary studies and art history are more interested in an object that appears completely ossified. Meanwhile, claiming the newness of new media gains us a little time while we consider how distribution has become networked and streaming replaces showing. As for, now I come to the controversial part. As for the technological, uh, how should we, transformation of everything all the time. 
As I recall, we never weighed in during the short TV panic that produced the video. Remember that chance character in being there. This is because we're suspicious of effect studies, and rightly so. How then do we analyze these devices that promise to make our work life easier, only to make them worse the more automatic they became? We should have predicted this moment. But here we are debating whether the internet is progressive or reactionary. That debate still rages. But the most confounding problem of all is that of the human subject in the age of networked connection. Here is our field, the field that established its intellectual credentials with the paradigm of the subject constituted by the motion picture screened in the darkened theater. Are we weighing in on the question of how we're constituted as senders and receivers of so much electronic mail? The next part is so controversial, I've decided not to give it. So I'm coming to my conclusion, which is also controversial in a way. Thank you, conclusion. Even without counting, one can tell that this year's SEMS conference um, will actually occasion more cell phone checking during panels than ever before in the history of the society. Now consider this. Daydreaming during conference papers has never been an issue. And after all, is there an intellectual practice more productive than daydreaming? And sleeping during papers is also OK. <laughs> but texting and surfing, question. Are tape paper deliverers competing with phone messages for the attention of their audiences? Answer, yes. <laughs> One theory is that even though we've read the literature on multitasking that concludes that human attention can't be divided without loss of concentration, we think that we can achieve this despite the science. Like the powerful intellectual deities that we are, we defy our human limitations. And let's not forget that there's also something really cool about pulling out a phone, because there's that whiff of importance one gives off. To be hip and important? Who doesn't want that? Maybe the height of this development is the presenter answering a cell phone while delivering a paper. I'm recalling a moment at a conference when my colleague Charlie Musser answered his cell phone during his paper. That was in 2009, when the interruption drew gasps from the audience. <laughs> Charlie? <laughs> Charlie, is that you? Charlie, I'm calling to tell you that it's the future, that we're performing the future here at SCMS, and we're causing controversy in the audience <laughs> be because they're not sure. Oh, this isn't Charlie, after all. OK, so thank you very much. <laughs> I'll get busy thinking. All right. Congratulations to Jane, all our award winners. Thanks once again to everyone who helped us honor these award recipients. If you're heading to Girls' Night Out, have a great dinner. Thank you for waiting. Alternately, you can go see Richard Fung on Queer Asian Cinema at the School of the Image of Arts at Ryerson. Silent Gems of Toronto Screen Archives at Innes Town Hall. And we hope to see you Saturday for Guy Madden. Good night, go eat, go drink. Goodbye.